Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Iron Hack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Welcome, Engagers. Welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game Podcast. And we have Mina with us today. But before we start, are you prepared to engage, Mina? I am absolutely prepared. <laughs> that is absolutely <laughs> great because we have today with us, and I, I, I know I'm getting it wrong. There is, is, is this slight pronunciation I'm getting it wrong, but I'm going to say Mina Taylor. Is that good? Oh, you nailed it. Well done. <laughs> She is the founder of Energize Your Voice, which is a New York City-based communication coaching and training firm that has an experiential approach rooted, of course, in the principles of play and performance. And she and her team support organizations to explore their full potential in public speaking, storytelling, and leadership communication. Some of her amazing clients include Uber, Red Bull, City, and E&Y, Ernst & Young. Is that, yep. is that it? Mm -hmm. EY. So she started her BFA from NYU Tisch and went on to earn her MFA in performance with a concentration in speech and vocal production. So you can see why she's all about communication and all of these things. And she began her career as an accent reduction specialist. She went on to transfer her theater training to developing an innovative approach for professional development. Is there anything, Minna, that we're missing from that intro? Oh, golly. You know, that's the professional <laughs> intro. I feel like there are so many more things that make me a dynamic human that was largely about my business. But, but here we are. Yeah, Hopefully. I think that's, that, that felt sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> if there's anything you'd like to point out, this is the right time. No, nah, we're good. I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fantastic, Mina, because we are going to be talking about today all about your experience, the things that you've done. But before we do that, we'd like to know, you know, how does living life as yourself look like? What does a day, a week, a month, what does, you know, being in your skin look like in a day like today, for example? Mm, being in my skin. Well, I love the, the way that you phrase that question because I really do think <laughs> about it that way. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you why. I think about sort of myself and my mind existing within the vessel of my body. So I really do. My day is a lot of energy is spent toward vitality and well-being, specifically, mm -hmm. am I feeding myself? Am I hydrating? Uh, <laughs> you know, getting out to exercise, being in the world, getting some UV and taking in that vitamin D. So I'm just, I do devote a significant amount of energy to that. Reason being, a day in my life functionally on sort of a more practical level is sometimes it can be really slow and I go into deep thinking or sometimes it will feel really Uh, frantic, depending on sort of what deadlines are looming. So today, for example, um, it's Monday, and <laughs> I woke up, and I, uh, I didn't, I, last night, I got home, and I was like, oh, nuts, I forgot to buy coffee. So this morning, I woke up, and I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take myself out to breakfast. So I took myself out to breakfast, and I love doing that. I start my day without technology, and so I went out to breakfast, and I wrote in my notebook and was making some notes around a course that I'm designing, and then uh, I went for a run, and then I had a meeting, and then I did some sales, and I'm working on a book, so I looked looked at some revisions that I made around that. And here we are. And then I have another meeting after this. And then at some point I will decompress with a uh, beer. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds absolutely great. I mean, so much stuff going on and a very good example of a day, you know, where you did all of these things that you're, some of them are every day, some of them just come up, but it, it, I think it gives us a good feel as to what are, what is your life looking like today? And mm. Continuing with that storytelling mode, which I'm guessing you're a specialist on, especially since you're you're helping your clients with that, we would like to go into a story, a story of one of those times where you're using these principles of play, uh, you know, all these things that we've been talking about. 
when you know you you faced this project, this situation, you wanted to go, you know, sort of north. Things went south. You know, it was one of your favorite fails or first attempts in learning. One of those moments where you know you had a lot of lessons to learn from, so to speak. Mm. So we want to be there with you and maybe learn a little bit as well. Yeah. Okay. It's funny. I'm like, as you're talking this, I'm like, memories are flashing. I'm like, one of them solidifies something. That's a good memory. <laughs> and because <laughs> I, I, I typically look at everything as a learning experience and nothing ever goes perfectly in the realm of human behavior. That is a total impossibility. So I, everything will always, to some degree, have aspects of failure. But I can really think about one that was a real learning experience. And I was like, dang, I did not do that well. Was um, I designed this class years ago called Spark, a dating workshop, not for the faint of heart. And it was all around analyzing first impressions. And so I would get a bunch of strangers together and we would do some gameplay. So I called them information building exercises. And then one at a time, people would get up, we would evaluate one another, literally strangers telling you what they thought about <laughs> you and your first impression. And then we would all go home. That's how it ended. How it started was, hey, I have this great idea. Let me try to make it this you know, instead of being a real workshop, I want it to feel, it's a dating workshop. I don't want it to feel vibrant. I want people to, you know, walk into the space and be like, Ooh, fresh fruit and wine. Yes, please. Really kind of get in the mode. (laughs) And I, in the future of running it, I limited it to 10 to 12 people just because of time. And people love to give their feedback about other people. People have a lot of opinions and I didn't anticipate that. This was early on in my training as well. I didn't understand sort of how people functioned within those spaces and within those environments and dynamics. So I had about 30 people (laughs) for that first round. We made it, everyone was standing in a circle (laughs) and we were all crammed into this space and we made it through maybe four or five people before time ran out. So everybody came hoping to get feedback and we just like ran out of time. And then I rented a space. We had it for two hours. We got kicked out. So then we finished in the hallway and I was like, (laughs) oh my God, this is the worst Represent. I just felt I'm. I really like to execute things with a high level of excellence, and I just did not live up to that self standard <laughs> that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, is is there like from from taking that experience and taking all that in? I'm sure you improved many things. You did it different the next time. But is there? I don't know. Like you approach something that could be compared to that in the future. How would you start off differently? What would you you know from the get go? What would you get differently? You know, it's interesting because I'm designing this course right now. It's a group coaching program. And it's even though I've been coaching for almost 20 years and training for, you know, 10 years, I have never done a group coaching course. And so I'm designing it right now. We're launching it next week. And like designing it when I say like getting particular about the curriculum, obviously, I know what the course is about. But that experience that I had with Spark. Even the very next iteration that I did with Spark, I cut enrollment in half. I extended it by 30 minutes. I got rid of all the, you know, hors d'oeuvres and just like made it about being here, getting information with the gameplay. And so the biggest piece I've learned from that and an element that continually gets reinforced and something that I'm bringing in with me in terms of this current course design is limiting scope of expectation for delivery of content. (laughs) So (laughs) how much am I giving them? What is realistic for them to receive? How much am I expecting them to contribute? Is it realistic to expect that much? Should I leave space to receive more? Should I have sort of contingency plans in the event that nobody contributes? So how do I really think about time management in gameplay? You know, like every game, has a time constraint. And I think about the same thing in my workshops. I have this much time 
these are our goals and objectives. How do I scaffold the program so that we not only reach those goals and experience transformation, but in the process, it's fun, it's engaging. The biggest feedback I get around my courses is the energy. And so that's something that I really want to maintain. And so that's something that I'm really attentive to. And so this spark debacle really, <laughs> really set me up to be very like hyper considerate of all of those things moving forward. Well, there you go. Quite a few lessons that we can take engagers from that experience from Minna. So let's move on to the next question. How about instead of going for one of those fail or failure moments that you had in life, actually going for a success, something that, you know, on the first or the nth iteration that you went on it, it actually went your way. And we want to sort of be there with you again and, and find some of those key insights that you got that, that ha- happened, happened to help it become a success. Yeah, absolutely. I, the first thing that comes to mind is I was leading a workshop for a conference in Amsterdam, uh, European Women in Tech, and I submitted my proposal. They accepted my proposal. They open up enrollment for all of the various workshops, and mine fills up immediately. The workshop was called Empowered Play, and it was all about embracing that moment that I call it the threshold of fear. So that moment when you want to speak up, that moment when you want to go further, that moment when you want to challenge yourself or go beyond your comfort zone and you meet the moment, do you retreat or advance? And (laughs) so this is really about how do we, through the process of improvisation and experiential learning methodologies, really embrace the notion of Playful expression, right? It has nothing to do with saying the right thing or doing the right thing. It's just playful expression. So that workshop filled up immediately. They asked that I do a second session. I said, okay, great, sure. Into the first session, we maxed it out at 50 people, five zero. And for a live improv, and this was a full group. This was not, okay, mm. everybody take your seats. It's okay, let's all stand in a circle. So we have 50, five, zero people standing in a circle playing these like very <laughs> exciting games. We had people running across the circle and stealing each other's places. We had people jumping into the circle and telling stories. You know, we had women just really laughing, but we had 50 people. Of course, people wanted to sneak in. They were like, what the heck is going on in there? So then we had more people come. So by the end of the first session, we had about 65 people who had joined, which is way over capacity. And that was a first for me being like, can I even do this with this many people live like this? Oh, we'll see. Uh, (laughs) The second session... We had even more people. We had 75 people. We had two circles going on. And it was remarkable. And I think the biggest thing it taught me, taking back from like what I'd learned in all of my years up to that point of group facilitation, is one of the things about gameplay that I think is something, and especially when it comes to facilitating gameplay, is you have to be aware of all the moving parts. Who are the characters? What are you in service of achieving? Like, what is their skill level? How are they engaging? Who are your prime participants? Who are the people that are lagging behind? How do you encourage them to add their value? Being sort of having your pulse on all of these different layers of the experience that ultimately make it all feel really vibrant and cohesive. And so that was a real opportunity for me to say, okay, I'm in this huge space in this huge conference center in Amsterdam with a bunch of people that I did not anticipate having. (laughs) Uh, But you know what? Let's roll with it. Let's, Let's kind of see what happens. And it was just a matter of me understanding that, you know, I'll liken it to a flying a kite, which is you have a kite on a string and you have a nice little delicate kite. And it's like, and then you get this huge kite and it, takes so like the wind just catches it you know so it takes a little bit more strength to hold the line taut and in control and so that's really how I had to think about it I was like okay how can I increase my presence increase my level of command over each action item while still making it feel like there's flow and it's extemporaneous and improvisational. So it's a really exciting experience, which I was then able to carry forth. And we've been able to 
have that notion of what is our capacity? If we do exceed capacity, what will that look like? How do we adapt? How do we understand the behavior behind the performance and maybe introduce things in the moment that will increase opportunity for high performance? And even then extending that into how we've been able to do that in the virtual landscape is pretty exciting. We had a training where we had 500 people and I'm still teaching improv to corporations (laughs) over the internet. And it's wild, but I think it, it really, that, that moment in Amsterdam, I think really was like, okay, you have the capacity to command focus and impart wisdom and skill building. Uh, go with that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So there was quite a few things that you went through there. Any, you know, if you have a one or two sentences of, of some key lessons that you took away from that, things that you would definitely repeat. I would say the biggest thing is be adaptable. Know that what you come in expecting may not always be the case. So with rigid attachment to that expectation, you will undermine the ultimate execution if you're not willing to be adaptable. Then I would say the biggest thing is have fun. If I had felt bent out of shape, you know, that all these people snuck in. If I had been frustrated that people were kind of having side conversations. If I had felt insecure because all of a sudden I have twice as many people staring at me and I feel a grave responsibility because they trusted me and added on the second workshop and blah, blah, blah. Have fun. So adaptability and have fun. There you go. There you go. Absolutely great. And you've been talking about creating these experiences and the way you did all these things. So I'm guessing that you have some sort of process, some sort of, you know, way of making, I don't know, your brainstorming. How does that look like? If you're tasked with something new you're going to create, as you were describing at the start, how do you approach it? What are the steps? What do you do first? What do you do next? How how does that look like? It's funny because I work in the corporate learning and development space. I know that people go to school for this. I did not. So my (laughs) approach is largely self-created. I started out as an actor. So the way that I approach it, and also in my acting journey, I produced films and I wrote short sketch comedy, et cetera. So when I think about designing a program, I think about it like I try to put myself in the position of somebody experiencing the program, right? If I now think, okay, I have been explicitly tasked with delivering and facilitating X skill set with the idea of X outcome, how can I now put myself on the receiving end of that and think, how would I want to explore that? Where do I need rest? Where do I need some energy? Where do I need time for reflection? Where do I need moments of challenge? And really build that into the architecture of it. But I really do think about it specifically as a a scaffold, which is what I mentioned before, we can also think about it as a narrative structure. So I start out with where are we starting? (laughs) Like, what's our status quo? How do we then uncover the ways in which we are limiting ourselves from reaching the ultimate objective? How can we engage in exercises that remove those blockers and then achieve that transformation, which we sought from the very beginning? And so I really do think about it as a sort of experiential arc that I then put into sort of more functional and practical delivery mechanisms. That sounds great. And, and how do you like, how do you do that? Like, what is there? Is there any tips, any tricks on how to achieve that? Hmm. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think. <laughs> it comes from experience as well, I'm sure. It, do, it does come from experience. And honest to goodness, there are going to be generic frameworks. So you're, you're uh, for example, you always start with, hi, this is me. This is what I do. This is what you can expect. Here are the rules of the game. I always like to establish rules of the game. So that means, and especially in this virtual landscape, know when to raise your hand, know how to contribute, know how to unmute yourself, know how to engage in the chat, you know, whatever it is, right? What are the rules of the game? And then I always address mindset. So like, but these are all sort of formulas, right? These are not, this is not novel. I did not come up with this. It's something that I think if if in reflection, if you've attended a workshop or training like this, you will have seen as well. And so then I think it's really about where do I, within this structure, within a predictable formula, find ways to deviate and find ways to elevate. Interesting. 
Thanks very much for that insight. Mm. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family and on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. And Mina, again, inside this world of play, of improv as well, is there some sort of best practice, something that you would say, well, you know, if you're doing this thing, maybe try this out and it'll probably or almost certainly improve or help your project be better. Is there some kind of thing that you can point out to? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. The number one thing. I don't care if this is in conversation. I don't care if this is in the brainstorm <laughs> phase. I don't care if you are in ideation zone. I don't care if you are in iteration zone. I don't care if you are in termination zone. The primary thing that will support effective gameplay, effective strategy building, effective uh, reflection, the principle of yes and. When we think about yes and, which is a fundamental aspect of improv. So the thing about improv is it is all based on a series of minor agreements. Those agreements, you cannot anticipate them, right? Man, I just walked into your house and there was blood everywhere. Yes, and, right? As opposed to, man, I just walked in your house and there was blood everywhere. No, there wasn't. Game over. So this <laughs> notion of yes, and gives us now permission to make agreements that that is now the information that we are working with. And so how that then relates to strategy sessions or brainstorm or iteration, even feedback, is acknowledges what was said and what was contributed it elevates it. So now the yes, the and component, right? I'm now elevating it. I am now contributing. Now we move into a space of co-creation and then we advance it. So now that gives the opportunity to move the idea forward as opposed to arresting it in its place. So yes, and acknowledge, elevate, advance. <laughs> the basic principle of improvisation, for sure. One of the most important things you can we wouldn't uh, be able to consider and, and live with if you are going to get into the improv world for sure. Absolutely. Great, great insights. And talking about recommendations, is after hearing these questions, sort of the dynamic of the podcast, is there somebody that comes to mind that you would say, oh, I'd, I'd really li like to listen to this amazing person, you know, in, in an interview like this one on Professor Game? Mm. You know who I'd love to listen to is Esther Perel. So she is a psychologist. Okay. She probably has a more official title than that. Uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> I don't, I can't speak to her exact credentials, but she's incredible. A really tremendous contributor around relationships in the space of relationship, the psychology of relationships. She has a background in the theater. She understands play when it comes to people. And she has this philosophy called erotic intelligence. And we can probably immediately make some sort of association to something that feels sexual. But if we remove a sexual component, not saying that that can't be an aspect of it, but if we remove that and we now think purely around the notion of eroticism, it's this notion of the moment before, the space between, the anticipation of, and how can we bring that in to make things feel like there's a little bit more fire, right? And so I heard an interview with her on another podcast, and I've read some of her work. I think she would just have some really remarkable <laughs> reflections on a lot of these topics. But I, I think she is a just real tremendous voice in the space that she works. But I also think it obviously lends itself to this sort of conversation. She also has her own podcast called How's Work, which is all about relationships in the workplace. And she doesn't talk a lot or explicitly about play, but it comes in every now and then. So I know that it's a it's a foundation of how it is that she approaches her considerations of how to resolve people's challenges. Interesting. We hadn't had a recommendation like that one. Um, I mean, I think like ever. So very interesting one to, to have as well. We'll probably be trying to, to see if we can reach out as well. And, and speaking Tell of recommendations. Tell her I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. She it's, it's she'll have no contact. idea who I am. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, there you go. There you go. So in the same terrain of recommendations, would you say that there is a, a book that would be sort of foundational or inspirational or something like you want to recommend the book to this audience, to the engagers, people thinking about play? What book would you recommend? And of course, why? I, you know, I was thinking about this and there's, there's a book that I like called Impro by Keith Johnstone, essentially talks about gameplay and improvisation. I think that's a great one. That's a great sort of foundation if you're curious around what that looks like. When I think about gameplay, I think about strategy and I think about why we make the decisions that we make. Why do we retreat instead of advance? Why do we, what is a play there? And so much of it comes down to cognitive behavior and the way in which we ultimately consciously present decisions to ourselves based on our intuitive understanding of our circumstance at any given moment. And so where that really incites my curiosity is in the space of behavioral science. And so I read a couple months ago, I'm, I'm staring at it right now, which is why I'm, hmm. I'm thinking about this, but thinking fast and slow. I don't know if you're familiar with this by yeah, Daniel, Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman. Yeah. yeah. So I would recommend that one. I just think it, it was sort of my first really heavy exposure into just all these different sort of theories and philosophies that I had been exposed to maybe peripherally, but hadn't really seen laid out in such complex ways and, and also in ways that informed one another. So I think that regardless of what industry you're in around the notion of gameplay or theory of gameplay, uh, that's, I, I would hands down and it's accessible, even though it's 500 pages, 700 pages, yeah. it's an accessible piece of literature, even for a layman like me, who's just sort of an enthusiast. <laughs> There you go. Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Fantastic book, Engagers. Definitely a very good recommendation. And in this world of improv, in this world of play and gameplay, as you were saying before, what would you say is that sweet spot of yours, that superpower, that thing that you do at least better than most? It doesn't mean, I always clarify, it doesn't mean it's unique. If you look at superheroes, there's many of them who fly, many of them have super strength, many of them have this and that. What would that thing that makes you special be? My superpower is synthesis. I am a really good listener. And when I listen, I am sort of cataloging the information and then I put it together. And <laughs> uh, so someone can say, well, I had kind of this thing. Or like, there's an idea. I'm like, here's what I want to do. I'm like, oh, so you mean this. And it just allows it to have this grounded, pointed action area. Synthesis, it's my, it's my superpower. I just get, I process things very quickly and I'm able to then reflect it back in a really concise, digestible, impactful way. I'm sure your clients definitely consider that a superpower as well. They do. <laughs> they appreciate it for sure. <laughs> I'm sure they do. So We've gone out of the terrain of recommending other, other of uh, yourself, all those things. But there is one question which is typically very difficult for our guests. And that would be, what is your favorite game? What, what kind of game do you play, which is the one you enjoy the most, perhaps? Well, I'm not a technology person. So we'll just go ahead. And if anyone is expecting me to say like Mario Kart, I'm just going <laughs> to like dispel any excitement or enthusiasm. But if I were to say something electronic, I would definitely say Big Buck Hunter, just because I think it's really fun. Uh, it's a bar game. But if I'm going to, um, I, I, you know... It could be a card game. It could be one of the games that you play. There's something yeah, related to improv I play as well. Soli I play Solitaire a lot, but it, it is more of a mindless distraction. I really like, so one of my teammates, he and I will have brainstorming sessions while shooting hoops. And so I, I actually really like shooting hoops. Does that count? <laughs> we play <laughs> horse and stuff. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So thanks a lot for all of those insights. I don't know if there's any final words you want to tell the engagers, any final piece of wisdom, whatever that's going to look like. Of course, let us know where we can find you, where we can find more about what your work, what you're doing, more about Mina Taylor in general. Tell us where to go before we say that it's, at least for now, it's game over. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll say 
always find me on Instagram. That's the best access point. And you can find me at, at Minna Taylor underscore EYV. Uh, slide into my DMs. Give me some fun gameplay ideas. I love <laughs> a good brainstorm. So lay it on me. And the thing that I'll leave when it comes to gameplay and effective gameplay, oh my golly, this just came to me. Breathe. Breathe. Hmm. No matter what game you're playing, no matter what part of the game you're in, breathe. When the gameplay also elicits this moment of anticipation, right? This holding, this um, desire for excellence to succeed, the the suspense, you know, um, the, the tension. Hmm. Breathe. It will allow your brain to soften and allow you to move forward with a greater level of clarity and purpose, as well as just make you feel overall a greater sense of ease and de-stress. So breathe. Make sure you're breathing. When in doubt, breathe. <laughs> there you go. Engagers, breathe. Definitely very good advice for sure. Thank you once again very much, Mina, for investing this time and spreading that wisdom, that knowledge that you have, that experience that you've had throughout the years and doing what you do best. However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast, and I hope you enjoyed this interview with Mina. And I'd like to know if you have any future questions that you would like to ask future guests, any doubts, any lingering thoughts that you have that you want to hash out with a guest. If you do, all you have to do is go to professorgame.com slash question and ask that burning question that you have. If it is selected, it'll come up in a future episode and you will get your answer live within an episode. And remember, before you go into your next mission, before you click continue, remember please to subscribe or follow for free using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.